Backend development used to be tedious and required a ton of boilerplate code. But with backend frameworks like Flask, this process is far simpler. In this video, we'll start with the basics of Flask and work towards creating a simple app with a database and host it on a live server for free. To install and run pip install Flask, import it, and let's get started. Let's first start by creating an instance of Flask which creates our application. Here, we'll need to pass in the built-in name variable so that Flask knows where to look for resources in our current folder. The way backend servers work is that the client, usually a browser, makes a request using a URL and the server then passes the URL to understand which resource to send as a response. These different resources are stored under different routes. We can create a route in Flask by using the app.route decorator, specifying the route and a function that is called when the user visits the route. For a start, let's just return some text to display to the user. Here, the slash refers to the initial route when the user visits the site. With all of that done, we can run it by using the run method on the app and setting debug equals to true here, which automatically reloads the app when the code changes. Usually, you'll see this inside an if statement to check if this is the main program being executed as well. Now, if we run this and open the link here, we can see that text being displayed. Besides just hard coding the entire route, they can contain variables, which is useful if the values can be dynamic, such as if it's an ID or a search query. We can add this by specifying the verb in the angular brackets, which can be named anything. The function will then be given the value as a parameter. Here, I am just displaying whatever the variable is. If we want the variable to be converted to a specific type, we can also specify its type and add a colon before the variable's name. This way, the route will only be used if the URL and the type of the variable matches. I've printed out the variable's value and its type here as an example. Up to this point, we have only written strings of messages for our response. But typically, we want to return a HTML file to render our front-end interface. In Flask, we can do this by creating the HTML file in a folder called Templates. I'll quickly add some HTML here. We can then use the render templates method which we will import and specify the file name to render it. Here, Flask also allows us to pass variables from Python to the HTML file. For example, if we had a list of articles we wanted to display, we can pass it to the render templates method to be able to access it within the HTML file, where we can loop over it using a code block, which we specify with curly braces with a percentage symbol like so. We will also need to end the for loop using n4. Within each iteration, we can then access the individual article dictionary and its title like we would in Python inside two curly braces. I'll simply render a list item of each article's title inside an unordered list. The difference here is that whenever we have a code block such as an if statement or a for loop, we use a curly brace and a percentage sign, and we will need to end the code block. Whereas for expressions where we are trying to display the value of a variable from Python, we use two curly braces instead. Now that we have covered the basics, let's work towards creating a note taking application that allows the user to add, view, edit, and delete their notes. For that, I've created all the necessary HTML files with some styling added to them so we can focus on the backend code using Flask. You can download them here and add it to a new project. The styles.css file contains all the styling which I've added under a folder called static. This folder is used to store any major CSS or JavaScript files and needs to be named static so that Flask knows that it's meant to be publicly accessible. Let's first create the initial route and render the all notes.html page. When we run the app, it currently only has one example node. We want to change it to be able to display all the user's nodes, but how do we store them? We'll do this by making use of a database with the help of Flask extensions. There are many Flask extensions available that simplify a common backend tasks such as sending out emails automatically or to authenticate users. The one we'll be using to store the data is Flask SQL Alchemy, which helps with creating and managing databases and can be installed using this command. First up, let's import it. We'll then need to configure the database URI, which is the location of the database file. Here, we'll use SQLite and we need to specify three slashes to indicate it should be a file in our current directory. Next, we'll create an instance of SQL Alchemy, passing our app as an argument. SQL Alchemy is an object relational mapper, which means that instead of writing SQL statements to interact with our database, it provides convenient functions to read, update, add, and delete new rows to the tables in our database. This means that we can create a class and specify the different columns as properties of the class, and have SQL Alchemy automatically create the tables for us. To do this, we'll need to create a class that represents a node, which inherits from db.model. From there, we'll need to create a column for the ID. We'll then need to include this data type integer like so, and we'll specify it as a primary key as well so that it is automatically incremented. Next up, the node also needs a column for the title, which will be of type string, as well as for the content. I will set nullable to be false for both of these two columns to indicate that a new node will always need both of these two values. And to create the database, we will need to run db.createAll using the app's context right before we run the app. This will create the database and the tables within it if they don't already exist. With the database up and running, let's start with allowing users to create new nodes. For that, create a new round and render the create node HTML file. In this file, we have a form for the user to enter the details of their new node. When this form is submitted, it sends a post request back to the same URL. We can use this and check if the request type is a post request to add a new node using the form details submitted. And if it is not, we'll render the create node file. 
To be able to access the request variable, make sure that you have it imported. We also need to specify in the route decorator here that the route accepts both get and post requests. If it is a post request, we'll first get a title and content using the request.form dictionary, where we can access the title and the content. These two values are given by the input fields in the HTML form. We will then create a new node using those values and add it to the database like so. SQL Alchemy also requires us to commit the changes to save them. Once the node has been added, we will redirect the user back to the homepage using the redirect method, which we will need to import as well. Currently, our homepage doesn't display any of the user's nodes. To do so, before rendering the homepage, we will query the database to retrieve all the nodes, which we will then pass to the template. In the template, we can then loop over all the nodes and render the title and content preview for each individual node. If we try it now and add multiple nodes, they'll be displayed in a grid, which is what I've configured in the style sheet. Let's also create a new route for the user to view the details of the node and for them to update it. This route will be called node, followed by the ID of the node, which will be an integer. We can then use this ID to query the database. I will use this method which will return a 4 fold response automatically if the node isn't found. Using this node, we will then render the node HTML page. This page contains a form with the current title and content as the initial value, so the user can update them here as well. To display those values, we'll pass in the node's title, content as well as the node's ID for the action here, so you can update the correct node when the user clicks the update button. I'll also show the node's ID here in the header. Moving on, let's create the update node functionality. We will check if it is a post request and allow it as a method of the route. If it is a post request, it indicates that the user has submitted the form, where we can then update the node using the form data from the HTML page, commit the changes to the database, and redirect them back to the home page. Now that we have this node details page done, the user isn't able to access it from the home page just yet. We can fix this by changing the URL of the anchor tag here with the node's ID so that the user can click the nodes from the home page and be brought to the node details route. If we create a node now, besides just viewing the node, we can also modify the node's content and click update which sends the post request to update the node. Although writing links manually this way works, you'll usually see the more common approach of using the URL for function, where this is the function's name, and you can add additional parameters the route may accept. The function will then generate the correct link. This way, even if the route changes, the link will still work. This is also why the CSS style sheet I've linked here uses the URL for method so that it is easier to maintain. I'll also change the link in the node details page here to use URL for. Moving on, the last functionality we have left to add is deleting the node. In each node, we have a simple form that when the button is clicked, sends a post request to the delete node URL. We will create a route for this URL with the ID of a node and we will allow only post requests for this route since there is no HTML to render for it. We can then query for the node, use db.session.delete to delete it and commit the changes to remove the node. Finally, we will redirect the user back to the homepage once it's done. Let's also add this link in the node details page and just like before, I will use the URL for function and specify the function's name. Now that the delete functionality works, we now have our completed simple web application that we can now host on a remote server to allow anyone to visit it. Let's first make sure to remove this debug parameter here to indicate that we are running it in a production environment. The free service we will be using is Python anywhere. Start by creating an account, creating a web app and selecting Flask. Here pick the latest version of Python. Rename the file name here to your Python's file name. Mine is called app.py. Next, navigate to the directory for the source code and upload the Python file. We will then manually need to create the templates and static folder and upload the files in them. This will be the three HTML files for the templates folder and the CSS file for the static folder. Once all that's done, we can head back to the web app and reload it. Now, if we visit the domain, you might encounter this error, which is caused by the database not properly being created. To fix it, enter the app.py file and run it. Once you see this message, you can stop it by pressing Ctrl C. If we visit the domain now, we can find our Flask application hosted on a server that anyone can visit on any device. That's the end of this introduction to Flask. There are a few more topics such as user authentication that can be used to improve your Flask app, so let me know if I should make videos on those too. If this video has helped, you'll probably enjoy watching this video next. Besides that, please consider possibly liking this video and subscribing for more of such content.